Uh, good evening, and welcome to our Historical Society program, uh, The Printing and the, and the Revolution, The Role of Printers in Revolutionary Boston. I'm Kathy Cavalieri, I'm president of the Westboro Historical Society, and we're delighted you're here this evening. Um, I just want to say for the, about the Historical Society, we were founded in 1889 to preserve local history through research, programs, and the preservation of artifacts. And our artifacts are conta contained at our headquarters, the Sibley House, up the street here at 13 Parkman Street. It's an 1844 Greek Revival home of the sleigh maker William Sibley. Um, for more than a century, the Society's mission has been to celebrate local history and bring that history to life through our monthly presentations like this one, Sibley House tours, and special events. And we will be opening the Sibley House on November 26th, Sunday afternoon of Thanksgiving weekend, um, and we'll be part of the um, Westboro, uh, the stroll, for the holiday stroll. And um, I'll tell you a little bit more about that at the end of the program. Um, if you enjoyed tonight's program, we encourage you to like our Facebook page, Westboro Historical Society, and check out our website, www.westborohistory.org. Uh, and through the website, you can also join us and become a member and help support our work. Um, the membership is available there. <coughs> this evening's presenter is Gre Gary Gregory, who some of you may recognize if you went on our Wicked Westboro tour in October. Uh, Gary told the story of the hanging of Hugh Henderson uh, for stealing items from the Blue Anchor Tavern. Um, Gary is a printmaster and founder of Eves and Gill, a living history printing museum adjacent to the Old North Church in Boston. Uh, it's one of only three reproduction 18th century print shops in the United States, and it's the only one in Boston. And I'm pleased to introduce Gary Gregory. I just took my first two slides. <laughs> um, well, welcome. Um, my name is Gary Gregory. I founded um, the Printing Office of Eves and Gill in 2005, I think. Something like that. That's when I bought my first press. Um, I also owned a tour company in Boston that went out with the, the pandemic. But um, this has been, um, we're located at the Old Art Church in the Clough House. Um, that's an old picture of Clough House, built about 1712. Ebenezer Clough is the builder of the Old North Church, so he's the brick mason that built the church. So this was his house. Where that gap is right next door was a house owned by Benjamin Franklin, interestingly enough. Mm -hmm. He bought it for his younger sister, Jane Mika, and so she lived there uh, for quite a while. Uh, but the, the friends of the church tore it down. You know, it was a fire hazard. It was a brick house. So um, <laughs> they, they knocked it down. But, they, but Ebenezer's house remains. It's just a lovely place. The third story was added in the 19th century. But it's just a really great, it's right at the end of the Paul Revere Mall, so it's just a wonderful spot for me to work at. Um, this is the inside of my shop. I do change the arrangement from time to time, but um, what we see here are a couple things. So this is the common press. Sorry, it's a little dark for some reason. Um, that's the book press and the newspaper press. Benjamin Franklin owned them. Uh, it's you know, the technology day. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, back in the corner, there are two other printing presses. Those are intaglio or copper plate rolling presses and we'll talk about those in a minute. So that's the inside parlor room of, uh, of the shop. So um, what we are gonna talk about, I wanna talk a little bit about the technology that they're using, um, that we print with at this time. So it's not, um, before I get into uh, the, the impact of the press. But the press, the first press that we're using is called the Common Press. Um, it was invented by Johannes Gutenberg in 1450. And literally for the next 350 years, it's that machine. Nobody thinks of anything different. By the way, if I'm moving oddly, I'm used to having a machine in front of me. I, I don't normally talk like this, so <laughs> I'm used to having the real prop line. Um, so, oh, hey guys. So, um, so the common press, it's going to be go right through the year 1800. In 1800, they actually invent the ability to make machines out of cast iron. So that's going to change things, but only from a printing press side. Um, uh, the, the types and so forth are all going to remain the same for a very long time. Speaking of types, this is I had a shop at Faneuil Hall for a couple of years until the pandemic hit. <laughs> um, and so um, I'm standing at a type case frame. So this is where we actually assemble the individual letters. In order to print anything, it starts literally one letter at a time. Those cases in front of me are my keyboard, right? So the upper case in the top has my, it's alphabetical, and has my capital letters, small caps, and accent characters. The lower case has my lowercase letters. If you're familiar with the term uppercase and lowercase, 
That's actually where it comes from. <laughs> my uppercase letters in the uppercase and my lower and the lower case. I know everybody always goes, ah, I'm <laughs> uh, So what I'm doing, I'm standing there with a tool. This is called a, uh, a composing stick. Now this is obviously for a newspaper, but I mean the Chinese invent movable type a thousand years before Gutenberg. Um, and the Koreans were casting letters 200 years before Gutenberg um, in 1450, but None of them had a production machine. They're all using something like this. You have to be able to organize these letters one way or another. I didn't bring any types with me because um, another thing about Gutenberg, he actually was an alchemist before he became a, an inventor of the printing press. So he created a couple alloys. And one of the alloys he creates, you know, alchemists are always trying to make gold out of lead. Well, Gutenberg was certainly messing with lead. So um, he created an alloy for a mirror project uh, years before he invented the printing press. And it didn't work out. But that alloy turns out to be the perfect metal for metal types. Um, even to this day, 500 years later, we're using Gutenberg's formula for the metal that we use to cast our letters. Um, and why I didn't bring any in is because they are made of lead. <laughs> Apparently it's bad for you, I don't know. Um, so, um, so I'm gonna assemble those letters one at a time, upside down and backwards in this composing stick. Now there's a system for it. You don't have to think about it. It's not as complicated as it sounds. It sounds complicated, it's not. Um, but it's really about developing speed. A good typesetter can set about 12,000 characters a day. For reference, um, let's see here, I brought a few props in. This is uh, something called the American Crisis. You can't see it because it's eight point print. But you get a sense of how much type there is. There's about 14,000 pieces of eight point type here. Um. Hand set. So um, this is a good nine, 10 hours for one person to set. Like the newspaper, this is um, this is actually a Boston Gazette, an original. So there's 12,000 characters on that page. I'll show it around a little bit. This block up here, when it comes to printing, there's a couple uh, graphical elements that we can employ in the 18th century. This this block is actually a metal cut, and it was done by Paul Revere. So Revere actually melts down printer's metal and does it like a woodcut, like engraving on wood. Um, but he carves three mastheads for the Boston Gazette. This is actually printed off a block that part of your cut. Mm -hmm. He does it backwards too? Yeah, yeah. Well, when you're cutting something, you actually don't pay attention to what you're cutting. It's more about the lines. You know what I mean? You're not thinking about what it is. This is a pretty interesting newspaper. It turns out it's from, hello, it's from um, 1769, January 16th. And um, what's cool about this is, uh, this, I mean, the British Army's occupying the city of Boston at this moment, right now, right? And the front page article, which the, the newspaper, the Boston Gazette, comes out once a week. Um, and so we don't do it every day. It's not a daily thing. Even in London, they're only doing newspapers once a week. But it takes a long time for us to get news, especially if it's coming from England. What, six to eight weeks for a ship to get here from London? So this is dated Monday, January 16th, uh, 1769. And the article, the title is London, November 8th, His Majesty's Most Gracious Speech to Both Houses of Parliament. It's the King of England's speech to Parliament in 1768. And in this speech, the King's telling Parliament, I'd like to tell you it's going well in the American colonies, but it's not. <laughs> I've got some news for him. He doesn't know this. It's not going to get any better. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, so that's typesetting, and, that, and the Boston Gazette, there's about eight pages in a typical issue. Two pages are advertisements. Um, we only save the third page for recent news, something that's happened, all right? So we're not setting all that type all the time. When that speech comes in, I can set it anytime I want. I just have it ready to go for the newspaper. Um, how many people work in these shops? Well, that's really hard to nail down. Um, that's a good close-up of setting type. You can see the letters there. That's some small type. That's about eight point, nine point right there. Um, and somebody, see what they did? That's wrong. They put the letters in the bottom there. You'll never memorize the case. You actually have to memorize which letter is in which box. And you'll never do it if it tells you what letters are in what box. <laughs> um, so this is, again, a typeset. So these are, that's a picture of a composing stick right there with some letters upside down and backwards. That's a couple of uh, paragraphs that I've set that are getting ready to be made into a large form. But you get a sense that those are all individual pieces. By the way, not only the presses, uh, the types, everything comes from London. We don't make printing presses in the American colonies before the revolution. 
Um, we don't um, we don't make those letters. Those letters all come from the Caslon Type Foundry in London, and those letters are the most expensive thing that we own. Just to give you an idea, um, I have seventy of those cases you just saw a minute ago. I have seventy of those. You have you know you can pick whatever type size you want on your computer, but I have to have the actual physical thing. And you have two cases for Roman and two cases for Italic. I don't have the button that goes like this. <laughs> There might be some, no, there's no account. So um, when it comes to the actual press, now I've got a form. If you can see this right here. That's a type form. It's a little dark, but, you know, there's letters there. And these two gentlemen were helping me out one day in the shop. And once we got the form on the press, um, we have to actually, to, to print anything, uh, we have to put paper here. Right? That's called my tympan and frisket. So I'm going to put my paper here and flop that down over top of it. Um, and then he's got two items in his hands. Those are called ink balls. And for every form that we print, I have to ink. I mean, for every sheet I print, I mean. So um, ink balls are leather over top a couple handfuls of sheep's wool nailed onto a wooden form. Think of a boxing glove or a jiffy pop. Right? It's like a dome. And I actually have to make them up every day. You can't see it, but there's leather on the bottom. And if that ink dries on the leather, I have to, um, it's, it's useless. It, once it dries on there, it ruins the leather. So every night before I go home, I take that leather off and chuck it into a bucket of water. I don't clean it. I just chuck it in the water so it doesn't dry out. And the next day, I come in. Now, this should be done by some kid. You know, some apprentice is supposed to be doing this for me. <laughs> <laughs> apprentice is certainly not supposed to be making up ink balls. Um, so, um, so in the morning, I just fish them out of the water, wring them out, start tacking and stuffing and tacking and stuffing and make them up again. I do that every day. So once we have the paper on, this fellow's beating the ink on, right? So you're going to do that for every sheet. The paper that we use, um, this paper right here, this Boston Gazette, is made out of the same stuff my shirt is made out of, linen. Not cotton linen, flax linen. you got to wear this. And the other thing about it, paper making, anybody ever make a piece of paper at a craft fair? How to turn out? Um, uneven. Uneven, <laughs> yeah. Lumpy. Bad. You could say bad. Um, it's ridiculously hard to make, right? And so, um, I mean, you take, you have to mechanically wear out the material, physically. Like one of the shirts in my shop, I just picked it up the other day. It's a blue and white check shirt. It has nine holes in it. All right, I should probably sell that to the rag buyer <laughs> because that's what you're going to make your paper out of, right? So in modern times, I use cotton paper. But apparently people stopped writing on paper a long time ago, so um, companies that make cotton paper in the United States have stopped making it pretty much. Really hard for me to get. But um, that paper was made, um, the first paper mill in Massachusetts was probably the, um, John Hancock's uncle's paper mill in Milton, Massachusetts. Um, it turns out to be in 1770, a fellow named Stephen Crane buys that paper mill. And two other guys. So it becomes a crane paper company. I use crane paper forever. That laid linen cotton stuff that old people like me used to put our resumes on. <laughs> you can't get it anymore in big sheets. <laughs> so um, so here we go. Now he's pulling up right now he's pulling the print. We've rolled that coffin underneath the machine. We folded all that over and he's pulling the bar and it's gonna press. We have to do that twice because there's not enough surface area on that platen to print the whole thing with one pull. There's not enough power in the machine to print the whole thing with one pull. I guess I should have showed a video of you doing this, right? Um, and then we see a print. I had, uh, that woman was actually like a descendant of like Thomas Jefferson, mm -hmm. believe it or not. Um, so yeah, so she's, we've just pulled a print and that's a Declaration of Independence. Um, I have a few samples of things that I print up here. So that's kind of the mechanics of this and I think my last slide is just uh, an oversized thing of a Boston Gazette. Um, but you'll see some ads on that and um, printers not only Print shops were interesting places because um, you, what you'll see is a lot of things. You'll see runaway ads for um, for servants and tradespeople. Like if your apprentice runs off, Benjamin Franklin runs off from his older brother. He actually runs out on his apprenticeship. He had a he was signed up for a nine year apprentice and got in a fight with his brother and he took off. So he actually legally ran out on a contract. And normally what you'll do is you'll post an ad: hat on when he went away, brown hat, blue waistcoat, <laughs> black breeches. You know. Check, uh, check nut cloth, and, we're, and pox or no pox, we're gonna describe you physically. Um, and if you stole clothes from me, we'll talk about those too, I'll put those in the ad. Um, the other kinds of ads, you're gonna, so um, interestingly enough, when Benjamin Franklin runs away, um, his brother doesn't go looking for him. The next, <laughs> ad, the next ad he runs is wanted, 
likely lad for an apprentice. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we also see some other ads. Uh, other kinds of ads that can be there that are more controversial a little bit are slave, runaway slave ads, or no, it's slaves for sale, um, to sell enslaved persons. So the reason they do it at the newspaper is because you don't want Pompeii knowing that you're selling them, right? So it always says inquire at the printing office. So they're not engaged in the business of it, but I guess, well, everybody, let's put it this way, everybody in Boston and in Massachusetts is engaged in the enslaving the people one way or another whether you own them or not it's all around you it's part of your life congregational ministers are one of the main owners of slaves believe it or not in Massachusetts uh, of enslaved persons so but they're gonna put those ads in the Boston Gazette and um, because they don't want the individual knowing that they're gonna be sold so who wrote the ads the printer um, yeah now the printers aren't necessarily educated people um, they're, they're mechanics um, I was just at Mechanics Hall the other night thank you my friends um, and mechanics are people who work with their hands. So they've probably gone to the sixth grade if you live in Massachusetts. If you live anywhere else, it's not a requirement. But um, uh, when we get rolling with this and we start getting the political thing, that's going to change who the writers are. All right, but at this point, it's usually you'll write the ad yourself and give it to the newspaper, generally speaking. They don't have copyright editors and all that. You know, it's, it's really, there's two guys running each press and, you know, other apprentices. So um, there's another technology that we use. It's called the intaglio press. You may be familiar with intaglio because of this very infamous picture, right? It's mm -hmm. called the Boston Massacre. Mm -hmm. um, so this is actually printed intaglio. And um, Paul Revere owned one of these machines. I also own a couple of these machines, as I pointed out earlier. This is invented in 1460 um, in Italy. We don't know which Italian invents it. It just shows up. Mm -hmm. One of the things I love doing in my shop is when I meet Italians, I'm like, you know, and then we start talking about the press. I said, this was invented in Italy, but we don't know which Italian invented it. And they'll look at you, an Italian will look at you and go, well, it could have been any one of us. <laughs> <laughs> and they mean it. You know, it's, it's, it's a lovely thing that they have about their, the belief they have about their, well, they were Romans, okay. Mm. They did a few things. <laughs> I just love, it's one of my favorite things is to see their response. <laughs> Um, so, intaglio, intaglio, this is a copper plate. This is a reproduction I had made a long time ago of the Boston Massacre. The plate is actually, the current plate is about this size. Paul Revere actually cuts it down. But if you can see, I'll just walk around with it. So you can see these are scratches, yeah. mm -hmm. right? And those scratches are below the surface. And you actually do this manually with a sharp tool called a bureau. So a big fat magnifying glass, you've transferred your image on there, and you're literally gonna cut the big lines so you're going to cut the big lines and not the small detail. I'm just going to fill that in later. This is about a 40-hour job for one for a person. I've printed jillions of prints off of this. Do you polish that? No. Why is it looking so? Because powery? it gets polished through the process of printing. Oh. Um, so I mean, at the end, I'll believe it or not, I clean these with baby oil. There's something wrong with that. If you can clean a copper plate, I think with baby oil, you probably shouldn't put it on a kid. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. Here we are inking a plate. So there's an ink dauber there involved that's on a jigger there that's a hot plate essentially. Um, I do that. Um, Printmaking ink is thicker, it's heavier. Beautiful stuff. Um, this comes from France called Charbonneau. Um, but I'm going to goo up the top of that plate. And then I have to wipe all that ink off, right? So there's a, a, a piece of muslin in my hand right there and I'm cleaning the ink from the entire surface of that plate. Once I get pretty close, I'm going to polish it by hand. So I don't know if you can see my hands there, but they are black as they can be. There's ink all over them. <laughs> it's a messy process. Most of the ink on my apron comes from printmaking. So um, now we see the rolling press. The one in the back there is actually an original press. Um, I got a phone call from Paris one day, and um, a, museum, a museum had gone out of business there. It's actually an original 18th century copper plate rolling press. Super cool. Came from the Atelier La Curie in Paris. Picasso made prints in that studio. Um, who knew? The place went out of business and I bought it and flew it over here. Turns out to be the only one on the continent. There's only four of them in the world. Wow. I'm not rich, I'm just stupidly lucky. <laughs> um, and so then I, I got a grant to build a reproduction of it and that's what this is. So how does it work? Um, we see over here, um, that's a plank. There's a roller here and a roller there and a large star. <coughs> right? So I lay that, um, that inked plate on the plank, I cover it with a dampened sheet of paper, I put a couple felt blankets on top of it, and I roll it under that machine. And under great pressure, that paper gets pushed down below the surface, 
and voila, I've made a, I've made a print. Um, when it comes off, it's going to look like this in black and white. In fact, this says engraved, printed, and sold by Paul Revere. But it, all the extent documents of this, I think there's 35 or 45 originals of this in existence, every one of them are color. So Eads and Gill, the print shop that I've uh, created, recreated, actually orders 200 of these from Paul Revere. But they were colored, right? So Christian Remick he, uh, was a watercolor artist in Boston. He did some of them. Um, we don't know if he did them all. It's kind of hard to tell because age affects the colors, the watercolors. But once that's rolled through there, once I'm all done with that process, the plate, believe it or not, is mostly clean. There's still just a little black residue in those cracks, so I have to just I have to re-ink it every time. You can make maybe five of these an hour, as opposed to 200 or 250 sheets an hour on that big common press, the newspaper mm -hmm. press. Yeah, so there's me pulling a print off. So I've run it through the machine, and there's my copper plate, and there's a print. Now you can see the inky fingers. Mm -hmm. um, Gary, what does an entirely old Graving. It's an Italian language. Okay. Um, so again, that's the, just the black and white print of it. Infamous piece of propaganda. And the watercolor kit. Now this is, I got a grant from the, uh, the Society of Cincinnati uh, in Massachusetts to do some watercolor research. Um, and so this is actually the first year that Reeves Company comes out with watercolor kits. Right, so this is about 1780. Um, it's a really cool box, and what we see is a black and white intaglio print that's been colored. It's a really cool box. It's about this big, but uh, but watercolors are a big deal. All the prints that, that anytime you see color on a print of this time period, it's been hand colored. We don't we can't print in color. We don't have, we can't do registration. Although the French figured that out in about 1780, but they're smarter than everybody else. And there's a young lady that was working with me a little while. She had doing some watercolor. So sometimes we see mixed media, right? This is an unusual occurrence. This happens to be a broadside that was put out right after the, um, right after, well, it's, it's that Boston Massacre play, but there's five columns of type around it. So you're gonna print one of these or the other first. My guess is you print the intaglio print first. Otherwise, if you screw it up, you're gonna mess up a whole page of printed type. So, but there's a big debate about that. There's a friend of mine in London that we go back and forth, what, what was printed first, the intaglio or the leather? So, but we'll also see a couple other elements here. So this was all done in black and white. This, by the way, is the most common sheet I get phone calls from. Um, people have these in their collections or they find them in their attic or something like this, that particular print. Of course, it'd be wildly valuable if it's an original. Um, but most of them are not. They were done in the 19th century in the wooden paper era. Um, and that paper was bleached with acid and they're all crumbling apart. If you, anybody librarian and you know this. So the stuff's all falling apart, but I've looked at five or six of these um, that people thought might be original, but it's a really cool print. The other thing we have going on here are the coffins. Now that's not intaglio, that's a wood block cut. So you literally take a piece of wood and you, you know, carve it in relief and, and you carve those coffins. One of the things I love about American art like this is it's, it's bad. <laughs> but, but it's so folk artsy, you know. I mean, I had a there's a, a group called the Wood Engravers Network, and it's people who actually engrave on ingrained wood. They're, and and there's some people that are. I mean, these are amazing artists. Um, and they had a meeting in my shop, and I kept and I showed them this book I have of um, of prints 1630 to 1830 in Massachusetts, wood cuts and ornaments. And I said, wouldn't it be wonderful to do a book with about ten of these just funky American cuts? Just, they're just really cool. One of the, maybe I'll have to learn how to do it myself. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Looking for a new skill. You know, I just need something more to do. <laughs> why, um, <laughs> why the coffins? That was for the guys that died in the Boston Massacre. Okay. I produced the t-shirts, too. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> well, you know, you guys sell merch. Um, so, um, uh, this is a funny line from the Massachusetts by Isaiah Thomas. Anybody know the American Antiquarian Society in Worcester? Uh, sure. It's founded by Isaiah Thomas, and he was a printer. He's a he's a patron. Uh, he's a printer for the Sons of Liberty, and I call him the the National Enquirer of Patriot News. <laughs> um, his shop was at the third floor of the Union Oyster House, um, but this is one of his taglines: "Open to all parties, but influenced by none." Mm. Right. Fair and balanced. 
Mm. Sorry. His, his press is in Worcester, isn't it? What's he, that? He moved his press out of Boston. He does. It's in yeah, Indiana actually, two days, a couple of days before the Battle of Lexington conquered, he was he'd been Worcester had been talking to him. There's some uh, an individual in Worcester was trying to get him to move a printing press out there, anyways, and this was his excuse. So he actually pulls out. Um, I think I'm quoted in a book about talking about how quick you can take one of these machines apart. Um, about Isaiah Thomas, but they come apart in about 20 minutes. This big printing press. And he did take one out to Worcester, and it's still there. It's in, it's called Old Number One. I've climbed all over it a couple times. Um, but yeah, so he takes it out to Worcester. But um, there, in Boston, um, between 1765, 1775, there's between five and seven newspapers at any given time. By the way, that's a lot. All right, there's about 12 or 13 printers. Turns out, New England is highly literate, right? Literate, not illiterate, compared to the rest of the colonies. There's, in Massachusetts and New England, there's a requirement for you to go to school if you're a boy up until the sixth grade. That, there's, that requirement doesn't exist anywhere else in the colonies. In 1765, when, George, when the Stamp Act hits us, you know, you, you don't need anybody to tell you about it in Massachusetts, you're gonna read about it. But in Virginia, George Washington, we found, they have a letter from him, it says, to the gentlemen of the several counties, you should go around and explain to the people why this is a violation of their English rights and liberties. Hmm not read this pamphlet or read that. Well, what's the what's violation of the right? Uh, the Stamp Act. Oh, the Stamp Act of 1765 was a, I'm going to talk about that, I think. <laughs> Maybe. Um, Why is the F's instead of the S's? Ah, uh, you caught that. <laughs> um, so that's that's called the long S. It's the most common question I get, and that's why I put it in here, just because it's fun. Um, it looks like an F, but notice the bar doesn't go all the way across mm -hmm. on the Roman letter. I don't think I have any italic long S's here, but you mean the really middle bar, hmm? the middle one? Yeah. So um, it's just a weird character, and it, it, it stays around until about 1800 when it goes out of fashion. But the italic version is actually prettier. It's, it resembles more like the handwritten F. Right? Yeah, yeah. So um, I'll talk about the stamp back in a minute. Um, so the well, first guy we have there is John Mee, um, Boston Chronicle. What a character. Me moves here in 1767, and he's got a pretty big operation. He's got a, he's got a, a bookseller, he's got a bookstore, he's got a print shop. He's a very good printer. He's really good at what he does. Good editorialist. Um, he's a sharp guy. He's about six foot four. Well, his, uh, his run didn't make it too long in Boston for a couple of reasons. It turns out that in 1768, we have something called the, the Townsend Acts, and there's going to be a non-importation agreement letter going around Boston. If you're a merchant and you're a merchant, and a lot of women have to sign this thing, some of them don't want to, but it says, I'm no longer going to import certain goods from England. We're protesting. So everybody signs this thing. Well, money's money. Um, and it turns out not everybody was actually following the agreement. And some people refused to sign it. If you were smart, you said, okay, I'll sign it and then do whatever you want, which is what most people did. But some of them said no. John Mean was one of them that said no. He said, look, I just started this business. I'm in hock up in my eyeballs. My creditors in London, I got to pay them, so I have to import stuff. And there were two sisters who ran a millinery shop who did the same thing. And they got in trouble by the Sons of Liberty. So, but in this case, my, me and owns a newspaper. And so um, after he says no and tells the, the Sons of Liberty to buzz off, um, you know, the Boston Gazette writes an article about it, how he's refusing to do this. Well, John Means comes stomping over to the Boston Gazette uh, office, you know, and says, hey, who wrote this? I want to know. And Benjamin Eads, the owner of the Boston, one of the owners of Boston, says, ah, you know, I can't tell you that. I'll ask the guy if it's okay to tell you. Come back tomorrow. Well, Mean comes back tomorrow, and Eads is not there, but his partner John Gill is. John Gill's five foot tall. We know that from the court case after this fight. Um, but it turns out um, Mean got mad at him, and, and they break, they get into a fight. And John Mean is six foot four. Now printers are tough by nature because they work hard, but. Six foot four versus five foot isn't much of a fight, <laughs> as far as I know. Um, anyways, John Gill gets beat up, and he, he Mean gets he gets a, a civil penalty against him, he has to pay him money. Um, but after that happens, John Mean is now in trouble, so he starts doing something. John Mean, to get back at all these guys, decides he's going to take care of this problem. He starts he gets special he starts getting special notices from the customs house, right? So he's working with the with the loyalists in the government. And they're telling him which merchants are actually importing stuff when they should. They're seeing all the ships manifest. John Hancock may have been one of them, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, so he starts printing them in the paper, in his paper, saying, uh-huh, this guy signed it, that guy signed it, you signed it, you signed it, and here you are still importing the stuff. 
Well, now people are like, ah, you know. Not only this, he's sending that stuff to other colonies. So he's actually undermining the entire non-importation agreement, right? Not just in Massachusetts, but everywhere. Well, we can't have this. He's got to go, right? So sure enough, John Neen goes to the royal governor and goes, look, I've gotten some death threats. People are after me. You know, you need to, you need to protect me. And the royal governor, Tom Sutches, goes, no, it wasn't that. It was Bernard at that point. He goes, yeah, you're on your own. <laughs> we didn't ask you to do any of this. You know, you, so he's like, okay. So he started carrying two pistols with him. Right, so one day he's walking up King Street, now called State Street, with another fella. And he notices a mob forming behind him. <laughs> right? And so, like Foghorn Leghorn, he pulls out his two pistols, right? And he's walking backwards up State Street. And this pistol drives. He says, okay, what two of you am I going to kill? I've got two shots. Right, before you kill me. Well, so they, they kind of creep up the, the, um, the street. And it's going to happen right here. I don't know if you can see this. That's the old State House. Right? There's an alleyway right there, it's still there. Well, right here was the main guard for the British Army in 1768. And so there's two British soldiers standing out, and John Meehan is coming back this way. He's in the alleyway now. Well, those two soldiers are just standing there. It's not their business. <laughs> Whatever's going on here, not our business, right? So, um, so Meehan actually steps up on the step of the, of the guardhouse. He's gonna go inside for safety. And when he does, one of our guys grabs a shovel out of a store window and swings it at his head. <gasps> John Mean ducks, the shovel cuts his shoulder. Boom, his pistol actually accidentally discharges and he shoots one of the British soldiers in the leg accidentally. Oh. <laughs> the next day, and by the way, John Mean was a very powerful voice. He was probably the sanest and best writer. Um, the next day, he's on a ship to London. He leaves. Ironically, John Hancock gets a letter from Means Creditors. Hey, can you uh, take care of this for us? You know, this John Hancock's like, sure, we'll take care of that for you. So, you know, just mopping up the business here in Boston. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's a really interesting look at a lot of different things that are going on politically, right? He's gone, the most powerful voice that the loyalists had in Boston, probably. So, um, just a little side. So, we got the, the fleets, they were kind of neutral, but really Tory leaning. Then we have the Massachusetts Gap, is that Richard and Margaret Gaper? Um, Boston Weekly Gazette, Dray, that's Margaret Draper. Um, that was definitely pro-loyalist um, newspapers. Um, Richard dies and Margaret takes over the paper by 1774, or something like this. And then we have the Boston Gazette and Country Journal, that's Benjamin Hughes and John Hill, the shop I've recreated, Massachusetts Spy. So that's the newspapers in Boston. Um, I always say no printing press, no revolution. Uh, and I don't think that's a stretch. You know, we don't have social media, we don't have internet, you know, anything like that. This is it. And so, um, talking about the Stamp Act, that happens in 1765. So, um, when this tax is laid on, on England, it's a perfectly legal thing. I might have a Stamp Act here. Yeah, there's a piece of one. This is the London Gazette from 1766, an original. You see that little revenue stamp right there? That's a half penny stamp on the front page of the newspaper. Mm. <laughs> right, little red stamp. Mm -hmm. They, they kind of missed the page or the page has been cut. Mm -hmm. A little stamp right there. So this is an actual thing, right? Mm. And when this stamp tax gets laid on, on England, it's perfectly legal. They have representation in Parliament, right? Everybody lives there. And so, um, and so it's no problem. In a very minor piece of legislation, Parliament decides to just lay this tax over on the American colonies in North America. No big deal, right? What's the problem? Well, it turns out that we think we're Englishmen. I don't know where we got that idea because it says it in our charters, you know, things like that. If you happen to read um, the town meeting notes of Westboro, a while back I came in and asked the town clerk to look at the notes from the 1760s and 70s. Guess what? They have them. Mm -hmm. um, the originals mm -hmm. and every town meeting begins with the clerk writing greetings from his majesty wow wow right do we think we're part of the British yes of course we're part of the British Empire so there's an old British cry no taxation without representation and so um, we're not making this up this isn't an American thing this is a British cry right so there we are we're just fighting for our English rights and liberties and that's what's going to get this ball rolling with the Stamp Act there were some things that happened before 1765 some of them somewhat major, they're gonna to lead to all this. But um, 
So when that happened, Samuel Adams up to that point had never done it. Anyway, so Stamp Act. Stamp Act uh, is a laid all across the American colonies. In Boston, we resist. Um, I have another slide that's going to show a piece of the Stamp Act resistance, but this is a, uh, oh, that's later, that's Tea Party. So, maybe I have it next. Yeah, this is just a sliver of a, of a Stamp Act protest. Uh, oh, that's also, no, that's it, that's Stamp Act. So what we see here is Liberty Tree, right? August 14, 1765. Um, this says, there's that villain, his name's Husk. He was a guy in New Hampshire who everybody thought had something to do with, with initiating the Stamp Act on America. And so he's hanging there. And oh, it looks like he's got a high, looks like he has a high place, <laughs> right? So this is what's going on. We hang an effigy of Andrew Oliver in Boston, right? So the stamp, ever see a better sight than a stamp tax man hanging from a tree? Well, there's a big uproar here. And in 1766, Parliament was caught by surprise. They're really kind of clueless. Um, they decide to repeal the Stamp Act on America in 1766, a year later, because we caused them to stink about it. Well, think about this. I mean, you're England. You're the most powerful empire on the planet. And all of a sudden, colonists are, are trying to drive policy in your empire. Well, Parliament repeals the Stamp Act, much to everybody's chagrin. Like, don't do it, don't do it. Well, they do it. But the same day Parliament repeals it, and John Hancock throws a big party on Boston Common. There's a pig, there's Madeira wine for everybody, even the kids. Um, <laughs> and so, um, uh, but the very same day Parliament repeals the Stamp Act, they pass another act, because they don't want this to happen again. That act is called the Declaratory Act. And that act states, the Parliament of England has the right to make laws that bind the American colonies in all cases whatsoever. Wow, ooh, drop the mic. You know, I mean, that's, that's a big deal. Um, it's gonna show up in our Declaration of Independence, you know, 10 years later. So, um, but, but what Parliament just said is, we rule you, no matter what. And everybody read that, and everybody knows what it means. So, um, with the Stamp Act, what the printing press is gonna do is start questioning the judgment of Parliament. All right, they made a bad decision. Maybe they weren't well informed, but they corrected it. We're good now, right? Um, okay, no harm, no foul. The town's next come along. Wait a minute. You know, now we're questioning Parliament. Now we're questioning the ministers, the individuals who are actually um, who actually implemented these policies. And it turns out that England didn't have a coherent policy towards the colonies ever. Um, they appoint this lord and that lord. They 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 all have their own ideas about what they're going to do, um, and it's it's incoherent. And we know it, and it's not really bothering them. We're still buying half of all the exports exported out of England. We're still buying their goods. We're still doing what we're supposed to do as colonies, so they're happy. But but in the newspapers, we're bringing all this up. Now I didn't dig in. I mean, there's a there's a billion examples of us going after um, Parliament, uh, of us questioning their judgment, of us going after these ministers. And in 1768, um, so with all the hubbub of the Townsend Acts and all the riots and things that were going on in Boston, Go Royal Governor Bernard. Um, he thought he was going to come over here to America and have a nice, cushy colonial governor's job. Came to the wrong colony. <laughs> I think he forgot these people were Puritans formerly. Um, so he really has a rough time of it. And so Bernard winds up really writing letters to Parliament saying, look, this government is at an end here. Now this is in 1768, 1769, right? Seven, or 1767, he goes, we're, there's, we can't govern, we need troops. Well, in response, the royal government sends troops to Boston. They send the Royal Navy and the, and the, the Army. And when the Admiral and General of the British Navy and Army show up, they're like, they look around Boston and they're like, yeah, where's this rebellion? Like, it seems pretty peaceful. <laughs> there is no rebellion. It's an overreaction. Um, and in fact, Parliament's only listening to maybe five people or something like that. And they're really listening to a very small sample of what's going on. But, um, but Samuel Adams begins, this is where he really, He's been, he, he uh, was weaned on the Stamp Act and now he's got, he knows what to do. He knows how to pull the levers, he knows how to motivate you, each and every one of you, no matter where you're from or what your class is, all right? So he begins writing something called the Journal of Occurrences. It's a series of essays. Well, um, what he's writing about is the British soldiers in Boston that are breaking into houses, raping the inhabitants, the women of the houses and their daughters and you know, stealing stuff from shops. Turns out none of it's true. Like none of it. A little, if somebody broke a window, a British soldier, act, then that he broke into the house, right? 
The interesting thing about this is Adams doesn't publish it in Boston. He publishes it in New York. So it shows up as news in New York. Goes from New York to Philadelphia. Comes back to Boston as news weeks later. By the time it comes back here, we don't know if it happened or not. <laughs> so Adams is doing a couple of things with these, with the printing, with these newspapers, right? And these, and these are essays that are printed in the newspapers. Um, one, most of the colonies thought New England were, were radical because of our background, right? And so they were kind of looking at us like, yeah, you know wacky New England or whatever. So, but, so what Adams is now doing is joining them with our struggle. Now we actually have a real army and all of us know what that is. I mean, having a standing army in times of peace is against the English Constitution, quote unquote. And so that's what this is. And so the whole thing, so everybody gets what's going on, but now he's telling them how bad it actually is. So he's, he's bringing in the other colonies, not just doing this and having come back as fake news, but he's joining them with us and pulling them in. And this is gonna be important later. We're gonna need all the other colonies to join with us. So, I don't know if I should describe this or not. We get to the Tea Act. Um, and the Tea Act is an interesting thing. Um, you know, gonna reduce the price, of the duties on tea is gonna make it equal to the price of smuggled tea. And, but something interesting politically happens here. It turns out that um, the East India Company was sitting on a lot of tea. They wanted, to, they wanted to get rid of it. They know we're competing with the Dutch India Company. And here's where the brilliant plan. They're gonna drop the duties on tea, make it equal to the price of the, the smuggled Dutch tea, but they're only gonna allow certain individuals to import that in the colonies. All of those individuals happen to be loyalists. Mm. Now, if you're uh, on the side of the Sons of Liberty and you Whig parties, you know you guys are all on that side, now what you find out is business. The only way you can really make money in, in this time period is to be a merchant, right? That's where the big money is. And so um, now what you see is, well, if, if I don't go with that party, then I'm out. So trade becomes political now. We can't buy from anybody in the world we want to. England is restricting our trade to buying from England, right? We, I can't go to Spain, I can't go to France, I can't go to Holland and buy things. So, um, so this is, it's a, uh, it's just kind of a big deal that, that uh, I forgot, I just lost my train of thought. Um, about this Tea Act, right? So it's a, it's a problem for everybody. And once we see what's going on, we're like, you know, all right, we, we, there was a bunch of chances in Boston, but with this Tea Act, this is really gonna be a, a watershed moment. Because once we threw tea, throw tea into Boston Harbor, what does John Adams write that night? This is an amazing deal. You know, he's, he comes up with some kind of quote. This is a big thing. Um, but they destroy personal property. And by the way, breaking into a ship in the 18th century is also a capital offense. So you could be hanged for it. Um, Peter Eads, who's the first printer in Maine, was Benjamin Eads' son of the Boston Gazette, the owner. And he writes, um, he kept a diary during that period of time. And in fact, there were, when he was old and poor, and his, uh, later in life, he wrote a book called Peter Eads, the first printer in Maine. There's 118 copies. It took me 15 years to find one. <laughs> About two years ago, I found one. Um, anyways, in that book, it's kind of funny. Peter Eads writes, you know, I, what happens is a bunch of the, Benjamin Eads is one of the co-planners of this event, of the destruction of the tea. And so that night, he invites a bunch of guys to his house. So they're hanging out at his house, and Peter Eads says, I wasn't allowed in the room. His father didn't want him to see who the men were in that room because of this legal problem, right? And so he says, my station was in another room. He's writing to a cousin, um, filling the punch bowl, which is now in your possession, which I did several times. Mm -hmm. He's making rum punch, All right? Um, so those guys leave Benjamin's house, which is right where um, Government Center is, and the print shop was right on Court Street. So they leave the house, go to the print shop, and there's where they don their Indian garb. Um, they put soot on their faces and blankets on. They don't want to be recognized on the boats. They're not going to be talking on those boats. They're, their hand signaling and stuff like that. They don't want their voices to be recognized. Anyways, Peter Eads writes, he was of course told not to follow them. You stay home, right? <laughs> sure, tell a 15 year old boy that. <laughs> um, so he goes down to the wharves, he, he wrote, I went to the wharves, I watched for two and a half hours, I got sleepy and went home. <laughs> <laughs> That's how darn exciting the tea party is. <laughs> um, so after we throw tea in, Bo in Boston Harbor, now the course of acts are laid on us. This is the act that closes Boston, the port of Boston. Right, so this is the thing that's, that more soldiers are sent to Boston. Um, our royal governor is now Thomas, uh, General Thomas Gage of the British Army. He's in charge of all the forces in British North America. Um, our 
our court systems have been, all the judges and lawyers now appointed by the Crown, the Massachusetts Bay Charters pulled away from us, um, and the Port of Boston is closed. Wow, right? So, you know, I talk about Samuel Adams making some stuff up. Trust me, they make a lot of stuff up, but they also have a legitimate beef, right? So, um, this is kind of another slide saying similar things, but who are the targets of this? Uh, of these of the press and what's going on. So the Royal Legislative Acts, local government, in this case uh, Francis Bernard, the, the royal governor, is forced to leave. I mean, the st they go after him personally in every possible way you can think of. Samuel Adams and his friends, and mostly Adams. Samuel Adams writes under 30 different pseudonyms. <laughs> 30. Why do you need 30? Well, you see extract of a letter from London in some of these newspapers, it's not an extract of a letter from London, it's Samuel Adams writing it. All right, so he's, he's really on it. And so um, they're going after the local government. I talked about individual government supporters. At some point in Boston, if you're a loyalist, you're in trouble. Out here in the countryside, you know, you're gonna lose your house in 1774 if you don't sign a loyalty oath to your country, which is Massachusetts, right? So. We have their parliament, the administration of parliament, and ultimately, after the course of acts, we start talking about the king. Now, the king is the only person that I can't print against. I can't call him a name. I'll be arrested. It's actually against the law for a printer. So people often ask me, well, why didn't the royal government just go after these printers in America? Well, it turns out freedom of the press is a big deal in the British Empire, believe it or not. After the glorious revolution of 1687, or 16, whatever, 1688, um, free press is a big deal. So you have an active opposition press in England, um, uh, you have uh, obviously an active opposition press here, but they don't arrest anybody until 1774 or 1775. Once martial law is enacted here, um, Benjamin Eads, like, um, uh, like Isaiah Thomas, actually packs up a printing press a couple days before the battle at Lexington and Concord and moves out of town. He goes to Watertown. So John Gill, his partner, stays in Boston during the occupation. Well, somebody walks into the, you know, the, the, the army office and says, hey, uh, have you arrested John Gill yet, that printer? And they go, no, why? Go, well, he's on the list. Why not? They go arrest him for printing treason and sedition for the previous 10 years. By the way, that's also a capital offense. Just about everything in the British Empire. <laughs> Cut his head off. Hang him. Um, so, yeah, capital offense. So, uh, so they don't, so we, we were able to write whatever we want as long as they don't call the king a name. Well now we're starting, before we're always giving the king the benefit of the doubt. Samuel Adams in a lot of his writings will just say how, how, how gracious the king is and how good he is, but then he's gonna start saying, but we think his judgment on this one is wrong. It's really insidious how the language, how, it, again, there's so much of this stuff. I should have brought some examples in, but I was kind of overwhelmed just looking at it all. Um, of how slowly they move and just by a word here or a word there, a word here and a word there, and the tone of the language, it happens today, by the way, um, mm -hmm. um, how they can turn your, your opinion about things. Oh, I'm not done yet, am I? <laughs> um, so, I, was, uh, I do have a, so anybody have any questions about what I've been talking about so far? Yeah. Just going way back, does the word font and point have its origin in the before? Um, point, uh, points, yes. Fonts, um, when I buy a font of types, I, that's me buying the types from, from the, it's not the typeface. So we use the term typeface. So, but we don't, it's really not, we're just buying Caslon types. We're buying Baskerville, you know, we're buying, so we won't use the same terms. But a point is, is finally standardized in one seventy second of an inch. It's a printer's term. What are you printing now? Well, okay, good question. I brought a few samples with me. And who are you printing them for? Uh, I sell them to the public. Ah. Um, so this is a Boston edition of the Declaration of Independence. Oh. Um, I'm the first person to set this in type since 1776. Wow. wow. Um, I actually do the most historically accurate reproductions in the country, so my jam is just making it exactly right. Um, I think I forgot to bring my latest. I didn't bring it. Um, the last project I did was this. Anybody sprechen Sie Deutsch? Yeah. Yeah? It's, 
The very second printing of the, the physical printing of the Declaration of Independence was done in the German language, just outside of Philadelphia. And why was that? Why was the well, there's a big community of Germans out there. Germantown. The Germantown yeah. in Pennsylvania, New York. Oh, well, yeah. because of Pennsylvania, got it. And so I started doing different versions of the Declaration. I do all kinds of things, but um, because of the way my com company is structured, it's a nonprofit organization, um, unlike Colonel Williamsburg, they have the Rockefeller buy them. They can print whatever they want, and they, they just pay those guys. I actually have to sell stuff to actually pay for the shop. So this is one I've done. This is the Dunlap broadside of the Declaration of Independence. That was printed the night of July 4th. John Adams was in the room. Um, most people think that handwritten declaration from the movie National Treasure is the official, <laughs> original one that everybody saw. Um, that happens in August. We don't write that until August 3rd. On the night of July 4th, John Adams has to stay after work, and they get this printed up. They had edited Thomas Jefferson's draft on the 3rd and 4th of July, and um, uh, and so um, this is the official document that's going to be sent out by horseback. Everybody's going to print from this. On the 15th of July, this shows up in Boston. By the way, if you find an original one of these today, there's 27 of them known in existence. They're worth about $30 million a piece. Um, Massachusetts, uh, uh, the American, Anth no, Massachusetts Historical Society has one. And I had my hands on it about two months ago. So these are some of the items that I print. Um, things like the American Crisis. This is Thomas Paine, The Use of the Times and Try Men's Souls. Um, you see that's an editing copy, I've made a few mistakes. Um, so this were there the, changes between the versions that went out? Like you said, this is this. Though they're all the same exact, same it's an official exact. document. The, the, the graphic elements change depending upon what kind of type you have in your cases. Not everybody has big display type. Not and then the one that they actually signed, they actually, um, that was, a printer did that and they signed it? Nope, it's handwritten. Oh, it's handwritten. No, yeah, it's right. hand and gross. And, that's, and then that was... But John Hancock signs that alone with the Secretary Charles Thompson. There's no idea that peel painting of the signing of the declaration. Yeah. That doesn't happen. People waited months to sign all of that. Some right? of them did, yeah. Some say, I want to make sure I sign it, you know. Um, but And then they made a, a some kind of a, uh, I forget what it's called, because they made presses from that version. Well, that's later out. on. That's 1828. So oh, in, in 1828, John Quincy Adams realizes that document is disappearing. Again, there's only one of them. Hancock signs it alone. Congress doesn't show it to anybody because their names are on it. It's treason. Treason. By the way, the British Empire frowns on that. <laughs> I had some Brits in my shop, you know, I, I, just for fun, I keep asking them the question. So, you know, historically, how did England treat people that commit treason against it? And one Brit said, Poorly. <laughs> Another one said, I suppose not very well. You know? And a third, it was an older fellow, he says, drawn, quartered, and hanged. I'm like, thank you. Yeah, they hang you for it. So um, they don't put their names out there. Nobody does until January of 1777. John Hancock's name appears on this document. On all of them, he's president of the Congress. No, he's not a tough guy. George III already said he's going to hang John Hancock and Samuel Adams back in 1775. So he doesn't care. So I print documents like this, anything I find interesting or that I think I can sell. Um, and that's, we also do these intaglio prints. So we hand engrave, hand print, and hand watercolor these. Um, so I have a series of these that we've done for Power Beer. So I just, I just realized I need to kind of branch out and print some other things. Um, one of the first things I ever printed was this. Actually, this was the first thing I ever printed. <laughs> and this got hung up in the middle of the night on December 17, 1765. The uh, Tuesday morning, December 17, 1765, the true-born sons of liberty are desired to meet under liberty tree at 12 o'clock this day to the public resignation under oath of Andrew Oliver Esquire, distributor of the stamps for the province of Massachusetts Bay. A resignation? Yes. We're forcing this, the guy who was uh, in this colony who was uh, given the commission to distribute stamp paper, we've harassed him and to the point where he's quitting his job. And once he quits, we get all the other stamp tax guys to quit all across the colonies. And that's why you won't see that little red stamp on anything printed in the American colonies. We really have shut the whole thing down. Yeah. You spoke of Sam Adams uh, printing a lot of fake news. Is that true of Thomas Paine and the other printers? Paine is more of a, he's more of an essayist. So he's not a printer. So he's just writing, he's right. No, I'd say Thomas Paine, I mean, he, when he writes common sense, that's an opinion piece. Um, what, the, what, what the newspapers are doing is something different. So they're actually, I mean, John Adams actually puts a quote in his diary one night, spent the weekend at the print house, 
creating occurrences and working the political machine. Hmm. What does he mean by that? He doesn't say reporting occurrences. There's no such thing as a journalist at this moment. And that's kind of the point of this. You know, when we talk about the power of the press, I can tell you I don't need to read the newspaper anymore. Everything I need to know happened in the 18th century. <laughs> it's just different, They're different mechanisms, right? Now we have social media instead of, you know, the Boston Gazette. But the truth is, you can sway this any way you want, and they did, right? The the I forget how the saying goes. The means justify the ends, or the ends just the means just the ends something ends like that. The, the ends justify the means. That's the Machiavelli. That's right. Yeah. So for them, it did. Um, and for modern people, it does. When you, you know, one of the things I'm trying to really, the next program I'll do is probably going to be on ma media and literacy. Um, because the Sons of Liberty were listening in their own echo chamber. They're not reading Draper's paper. The, the essays about that were counteracting what Adams was writing was in other newspapers. The only thing they're reading is the rebuttal to that essay that was written in the other newspaper in the Boston Gazette. Right? So it's really, really fascinating. And if you take away anything from any of this, you might see some common themes. I don't know if I hit on them, but the same stuff's happening today with corporate media and large money interest and political parties. So, you know, watch C-SPAN. Really, it's boring as dirt, but you know, at least you're getting the real thing, not some bobblehead opinion piece, which, which most of this was. And there's still fake news at times. Yeah, of course. <laughs> it's politically motivated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yeah. So you're trying to like do it in the old style, but you're now having to find paper that is has some cloth content in it. Can you get some? No, no. There's no such no. thing as flax linen paper anymore. No, you can't even get a paper maker to make it for you. There's not no, enough no. flax linen scraps, um, if you will. Uh, a lot of the like the money paper, the crane paper makes used to be made from blue jean cutoffs. All the scrap from making blue jeans until they started putting spandex in it, and then. Ukraine had a crisis. Um, they couldn't use it anymore. So, yeah, I mean, the press is the, almost everything I'm doing is original equipment except for the paper. And the, and the ink? My ink, no, I, I have an 18th century formula ink made for me by J.M. Fry in Virginia. Oh, wow. Cargo mm. black, boiled linseed oil, and pine resin. Beautiful mm. stuff. Wow. Mm. So you only use one kind of ink? Black. black. And <laughs> was uh, or the paper made out of linen pieces? No, 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 fiber. I mean, the, oh, I know how you know you get flax. And all no, that. no, you're going to take a shirt like this once it's got holes shred in it, it, mechanically worn out. You shred it, babe. Well, ah. you you, you cut it and they yeah. just tear it. Yeah. And then they put them in bundles and they put them in a trough with a liquor. And there's a um, there's a ferment a fermentation process that breaks down that that breaks it down for a couple weeks. And then you're going to put it under water hammers with a water wheel and you're going to beat it into fiber. And what you wind up with is a milky vat. Uh, it looks like milky water, but it's yeah. fiber, linen fiber. And you have this really high-tech screen. Well, I shouldn't say high-tech. High it's got a million wires going in one direction and, and about an inch apart, half inch apart, a, a larger wire that forms the screen. Um, you dip it in that vat, you raise it up, you do the paper dance, right? And those fibers bond, you flop it out on a piece of felt, and you do that 999 more times that day. Mm -hmm. Two men making paper can make a thousand sheets of paper a day. It's all made by hand. Mm -hmm. So I did have a wonderful paper mill up in Montreal that were making paper specially for me. For the, it was beautiful. And I called them during the pandemic, like we don't make that anymore. I, I literally cried. It was the best mm -hmm. paper ever. Mm -hmm. so. But that's really my biggest problem, is paper. And I can't buy any from Williamsburg? No, because no, no, they all buy the same stuff. We all buy the same stuff. They were buying crane paper too. So we all struggled when crane went out. I bought my printing press from Corner Lane for that spare. Is there a third location of a, a printing The National Park Service. I mean, there's there's actually more than three. There's mm -hmm. three of these. There's a lot of people have these wooden presses, mm -hmm. but only a couple do what we do. So. Mm -hmm. How do you get your helpers, your apprentices? Um, I, well, I don't really apprentice anybody. So these are people generally who are, um, they come to me all kinds of ways. I mean, when I had a big shop, I had 10 people working for me. Um, you know, I would hire history students for the summer, um, anybody who had an interest in this. So now it's just, now it's really tricky. Um, the engraver that works for me, Andy Volpe, he uh, he's done a lot of programs around here. Um, so he works a couple days a week, but he does this full time. Um, and I have a, a, a history student from Worcester State who works with me. 
How do you get the ink off your hands? Um, Gojo. <laughs> Mechanics trees. Lard actually works really well. That's what they use in the Lard? Yep. Wow. Or use a bacon. Hmm? That's a poor use of bacon. I don't know. We use lard for all kinds of things. You ever make french fries in it? Woo. <laughs> uh, well, hey, thanks so much. If anybody has any other questions, You want to take a look at some of the stuff? The way that you open your um, uh, place well, of business downtown. Tuesday, Tuesday, uh, Tuesday through Sunday, Tuesday through Sunday, eleven to five. I'm there on the weekends, so I'm there Saturday and Sundays. Mm. So check them out. Yeah. Check them out when you're. I'll show you how the thing works. Just remind me you were here. <laughs> <laughs> Special treatment. Okay. And I just want to let everybody know we have two other events coming up. Uh, we have on Wednesday uh, at 3.45 to 4.30, Chris is going to give a historic walk downtown in honor of Kindness Week, um, bringing people kind of in a little circle uh, of the downtown, pointing out homes of notable Westboro personalities and chalking some words of kindness at their locations. And um, as I mentioned, uh, Thanksgiving weekend on the Sunday, uh, the 26th from 1 to 4, the Sibley House will be open for docent tours and for a kid's craft. So um, you know, we'll be publicizing those. So we hope to see you on either of those events. Okay. And thank you. Our, and our next, we're going to be having our sale, our holiday sale, our holiday bazaar will be December 1st. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs>